last paper in our session. Uh, um, Tamon Takamura is going to, from Banco, Bank of, the, of Canada, is going to present it. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to present our work today. Uh, I'm going to present banking dynamics, market discipline, and capital regulations. This is a joint work with Victorious Rule and Yas Terajima, and the usual disclaimer applies. So this is another paper about the counter-cyclical capital buffer, which is a time-varying capital requirement in Basel III. As uh, Diana mentioned this morning in her discussion, this regulation addresses the procyclicality problem of constant capital requirement, which could go against stable loan supply across financial cycles. This is because if capital requirement is kept constant, it effectively becomes more stringent during financial downturns when uh, banking funding conditions become tighter. But by reducing capital requirements in bad times, CCYB could potentially alleviate this problem and help smooth bank credit supply over time. In Canada, CCYB is implemented uh, under a slightly different name, under Pillar 2, and it was introduced in 2018 at the level of 1.5 percentage point. So this means that banks at that time had to maintain at least 13% of capital ratio, which could have gone down to 11.5 had the buffer been released. So in this paper, we want to understand to what extent this kind of time-varying capital uh, requirement, when it is released, affects uh, the banking industry in Canada. And another motivation of our paper comes from market discipline, which is viewed as an external, important external force uh, that complements capital regulations in Basel III. Market discipline is um, promoted through disclosure requirements on banks under Pillar III and it is expected to facilitate the pricing of individual bank risk by investors to limit uh, banks over borrowing from the wholesale market. So both market discipline and CCYB have important implications for banks' decisions to take leverage, and in this paper we want to understand the uh, interaction between these two objects. And based on these motivations, we pose broadly two different questions. The first question is, what's the impact of releasing CCYB through a great financial crisis-like episode? We want to understand the average impact on bank credit supply and the probability of bank default. We're also interested in the uh, heterogeneous policy impacts across banks with different capital ratios. The second question of a paper is, how does market discipline change the way banks react to CCYP, and are there any heterogene heterogeneity around uh, banks' reactions? And to answer these questions, we develop a dynamic model of the banking uh, industry with heterogeneous banks, and we simulate that model to quantify the impact of releasing CCYP. And I'll come back to uh, the basic features of the model and how we do simulations in a later slide, but I want to uh, show you uh, the main results of the paper uh, for the interest of time. So regarding the first question, we find that a release of CCYB indeed helps smooth credit supply and probability of bank default, and these are the intended uh, consequences of this regulation. Quantitatively, we only find small impacts of releasing the buffer if the buffer size is as small as 1.5%, which was the case when it was initially introduced in Canada. This is because uh, banks on average hold private capital buffers above the regulatory requirement to avoid violating uh, the regulatory uh, minimum. Uh, but if this is the case, then uh, larger buffers would have a larger impact. And indeed, uh, we find that 5%, uh, releasing the 5% uh, buffer uh, would have a larger impact through a counterfactual uh, simulation. 
Regarding the uh, differential policy impacts, we find that the impact uh, varies across banks, especially uh, there is a larger impact on low capitalized banks. These banks have almost no private capital buffers prior to the crisis, so even a small release of the buffer has a more visible impact on them. For the market discipline, we find that market discipline raises uh, capital ratios in normal times through precautionary motives of the banks, which helps soften the impact of the crisis if it happens outside of the stationary state. However, market discipline could be a double-edged sword. When a crisis happens unexpectedly, market discipline could increase the rollover risk in the sense that it becomes too costly for banks to roll over their debt while remaining solvent. And as a result, even large and well-capitalized banks uh, could become vulnerable to a crisis shock if they have a large amount of wholesale funding on their balance sheet. So what's the contribution of a paper? Relative to many other papers on CCYB in the literature, I guess our contribution is in the analysis of uh, the interaction between CCYB and the market discipline. And we use a dynamic model of banking industry with heterogeneous banks to do this. And our model can speak to precautionary motives of banks, dynamic risk associated with wholesale funding, and also the impact of the buffer size on the effect of uh, releasing CCYB. So let me talk briefly about the basic features of a model. A model is a heterogeneous bank model in which aggregate states uh, switches stochastically over time between normal and crisis state. And each bank incurs idiosyncratic long failure rate shocks, which gives us a distribution of shock of banks. While these shocks are exogenous in our model, the individual decisions of banks whether to default or not is endogenous. And this endogenous bank default probability determines the risk premium on banks' wholesale funding. So for example, if a bank decides to increase its leverage through wholesale funding, its default probability increases, and the amount uh, of discounting uh, on the uh, wholesale funding increases, and that limits the amount uh, bank, that that bank can raise uh, from uh, the market funding. And that's how the market discipline works in a model. But even though we have market discipline on the wholesale funding side, our model also features retail deposits that are given exogenously at a constant rate. So this gives rise to an inefficiency from moral hazard due to limited liability, and thus a rationale for having capital regulations. This is uh, how the balance sheets of banks uh, would look like. They invest in long-term illiquid loans, which are funded by insured deposits, wholesale funding, and their own equity. And banks can issue uh, their own equity uh, with some costs. And banks must satisfy capital requirements, including uh, the time-varying capital component. So using this model, uh, we simulated and evaluate uh, the dynamic impact of releasing CCYB. And the way we do the simulation is to first calibrate the uh, banking industry to 2017, right before the CCYB was placed in Canada at the level of 1.5%. And we assume that the industry is in a stationary state, meaning that banks anticipated the probability of a crisis but the actual crisis has not happened for a long enough time. So this gives us a stationary distribution of banks, which we can use as a starting point of simulation. And then we assume that a crisis happens in years two and three, in which the average loan failure rate increases by 50%. The crisis dissipates after uh, year three, and the industry gradually reverts back to uh, its original uh, stationary state uh, over time. And even though we use this particular crisis recovery episode, this is different from a perfect foresight simulation 
because banks only know the transition probability of shocks and they learn where the economy stands as shocks are revealed over time. And using this scenario, we simulate aggregate dynamics and analyze impulse response functions to evaluate the impact of releasing CCYB. In particular, we compare two different policy scenarios, one in which the CCYP is not released, which is represented by the blue line where the capital requirement stays at 13% all the time, versus when the CCYP is released during the financial crisis period in years two and three, so the capital requirement goes down to 115 and the difference between the two can be attributed to the policy impact. And to understand differential policy impact, we keep track of three different uh, bank groups. Uh, the top 10% groups, the bottom 10% groups, and the average, uh, the industry average, uh, all sorted in terms of capital ratios in the initial distributions. So let me now talk a little bit about the impact of market discipline before a crisis happens. This table shows some statistics from the stationary distribution under a baseline scenario of 1.5 percentage points CCYP. As I mentioned earlier, banks are required to hold at least 13% of capital ratios, but they have some private capital buffer above that, and in the left-hand side column, this shows the case with market discipline, and the average capital ratio is 14.64%. On the right-hand side column, that number declines to 13.85%. So without market discipline, banks take uh, more risk, and as a result, bank insolvency rate is higher. So market discipline in stationary state makes banks more prudent and hold more capital, and it is in this sense that market discipline reinforces CCYP in normal times. But market discipline is not counter-cyclical, so it could have an opposing effect if a crisis happens outside of this steady state when a shock happens. And that's something that I am going to mention uh, in a later slide. But before that, let me show you the dynamic impact of releasing CCYP of the size uh, 1.5%. As I mentioned earlier, I keep track of three different bank groups. The top panel shows the top 10% groups. The middle one is the industry average, and the bottom panel shows the bottom 10% groups sorted in terms of capital ratios in the initial distribution. So let's look at the middle panel, which shows the industry average. The panel shows that the capital ratios of banks decline during the crisis period in year two and three. This is because the average loan failure rate increases during this period. And the decline in the capital ratio is larger when the buffer is released. This is because banks are allowed to take a higher leverage. But even though the total capital requirement goes down from 13%, which is indicated by the solid line, down to 11.5%, uh, which is shown by the dashed line, banks are not using that extra space created by the regulation. A part of the reason for this is that uh, they hold private capital buffers before a crisis happens, so that helps them absorb some of the negative impacts of the crisis but also they want to maintain some margins above the regulatory requirement. So when the buffer is small, the headroom is too small for them to utilize uh, that buffer. In contrast, the low capitalized banks on the bottom panel, they don't have, they almost have no private capital buffers at the beginning, so even a small release of buffer helped them absorb the negative impact of the crisis. So in this way, our model can capture differential policy impacts of releasing CCYP depending on the capital ratios of banks, and this will help us understand uh, the impact of uh, the policy on new loan issuance and the probability of bank default as well. 
So let's look at the new loan issuance. On impact of the shock in the middle panel in year two, the new loan issuance tanks and a release of the CCYB shown by the, uh, the difference between the red line and the blue line mitigates the decline in the new loan issuance. And this is the intended consequence of the regulation, but the mitigation impact is limited to less than five percentage point relative to the overall decline of 60%. In contrast, low capitalized banks on the bottom panel, their mitigation impact is much larger, almost uh, exceeding 10 percentage points. And this difference reflects differential policy impacts on capital ratios that we have just seen in the previous slide. A similar pattern holds for the probability of bank default on impact of the shock in the middle panel in year two. The probability of bank default increases. A release of the buffer helps um, reduce the uh, increase in the probability of bank default and the mitigation impact is quantitatively larger for low capitalized banks on the bottom panel for exactly the same reason as before. Going back to the middle panel, this picture also shows the cost of releasing CCYB. Allowing, C allowing banks to take a higher leverage during the crisis periods means that banks become riskier. So this manifests itself in the form of higher probability of bank default relative to the case when the buffer is not released in the following years, for example, in year three. And this is the cost that the regulator needs to weigh against the benefits. So, so far I have shown you that when the buffer size is small, then the quantitative impact of releasing a CCYP is limited. This picture shows that when the buffer size is increased to five percentage point, it has a larger impact. This is because banks are more willing to utilize the headrooms uh, given by the release of uh, the policy. And interestingly, in Canada, uh, the financial regulator increased the upper bound of the time-varying capital requirement from the previous level of 2.5% to 4% earlier this year. And I'm curious to, curious to see uh, how this increase in, of the buffer has uh, some real impacts uh, down the road if uh, they need to release it. The final slide that I want to show you today is the dynamic impacts of market discipline when the CCYP is released. In principle, market discipline should make banks safer by uh, inducing them to build up a higher buffer prior to the crisis. So when the crisis happens, they should remain uh, safer. And indeed, that story holds on average as you can see from the middle panel, the probability of bank default with market discipline shown by the solid line remains lower than the case uh, without, which is shown by the dashed line. But if we shift our eye to the top panel on impact of the shock in year two, market discipline makes even well-capitalized banks more vulnerable to a crisis shock. And this sounds a little bit counterintuitive but what's happening here is that these are the banks that have a lot of wholesale funding relative to what they need for new investments to sustain their large balance sheets. So there's a lot of rollover risks involved for these banks and they're aware of it and that's why they're well capitalized in the first place. But even so, when a low probability event like a crisis happens, uh, they have difficulty rolling over the debt because market investors are sensitive to a higher risk of uh, bank default. So I guess I'm running out of time, so let me wrap up. Our analysis confirms the intended benefits of CCYB uh, through smoother credit supply and bank insolvency dynamics, uh, but the average quantitative impact depends on the size of the buffer and also how much capital ratios uh, banks have prior to the shock. Regarding the market discipline, it has two opposing effects. It complements CCYP by inducing them to hold a higher buffer, but 
for banks holding a larger wholesale funding, it, they could have a larger rollover risk and that could work against CCYB. Thank you. So discussing this paper is Javier Suarez from Sanfi. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, thank you, whoever is responsible for putting me in the program. Um, as a discussion of this paper that touches uh, on my, uh, one of my research uh, fields uh, very, very closely. It's been a pleasure to read the paper, even if a little bit in a very busy period. Um, I apologize in advance for potentially a too linear type of discussion where I will spend most of my time uh, with the overview uh, of what is in the current version, uh, but I will drop uh, as I advance uh, some of my, of my reactions. And uh, then at the end I will have a list of, uh, a list of comments. So this paper, as, as, as Tamon has uh, shown us, proposes and calibrates and, uh, what I will call an ambitious industry uh, dynamics model aimed to jointly analyze the effects of counter-cyclical uh, capital buffers like the CCYB, what in Canada is called the domestic stability buffer, and market discipline. Well, this, this is a little bit peculiar, I found, because I think that analyzing one of them will have been enough, but somehow you, you play with the variation of uh, on and off market discipline, understood as a wholesale funding that is either priced uh, according to the risk of each bank, or otherwise, like if this market funding, I understand, were sort of insured. Uh, the same way uh, deposits are, are insured. So indeed, this is an important source of market discipline. Now, the, the model features bank heterogeneity, bank default, and distributional dynamics. So all this is, is uh, computationally demanding. At the same time, as I was emphasizing in my first sentence, this is an industry equilibrium model is not a, a dynamic a stochastic general equilibrium model. The cyclicality is captured by the evolution of an uh, exogenous aggregate state that moves up and down. And actually the elements of industry equilibrium in the model are very limited. It's almost aggregation of uh, individual dynamic optimization problems, and I try to explain that there. Uh, they, the banks are subject to both idiosyncratic shocks to their default defaults on their loans, as well as some type, banks can be of a type that makes them large or tend to be large, and or, or, or some type that tends to make them, to make them small. So they transition individually across those states, but at the level of the industry, the only feature that is equilibrium is the entry and exit. There is endogenous exit, but then the assumption that the exiters are uh, replaced by entrants. And, and then the other market price in the model is the price of wholesale funding but this is uh, individually done at the level of each bank. So I will say that the strength of the paper is at solving a dynamic optimization problem for the banks, very much like the first paper we saw in this session, and then looking at industry-wide uh, implications by aggregating across essentially a number of individual uh, histories. Now, Something that, as I say in the comments part, but I can anticipate now as I just explained the ingredient, something that makes me a bit nervous of the current formulation is what I will call a shortcut in the modeling of the other side of the market. So these banks are operating in partial, partial equilibrium in the sense that instead of feeding with their loans 
the supply of a market for loans where there is a common demand for loans or extracting or taking deposits from a market where there is a supply of deposits, each of them is endowed with a fixed amount of deposits and then each of them faces convex or eventually convex, it's actually more convoluted than that, is first concave then convex, cost of originating new loans, that is the way to close the model as for how many loans the banks want to make. In my view, I mean, maybe after experience as, as quantitative macro banking person, what this is, 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 is doing is sort of substituting the calibration of a market demand for loans and a market supply of deposits that the banks are accommodating and where, if you were good doing that, that, that alternative instead of the pure individualistic bank alternative or shortcut, you will be able to see that banks not hit by a shock replace in the supply of loans or in the demand of deposits banks that are hit uh, by a shock. This is totally missed and is sort of mysteriously uh, in a sense, uh, moving up and down in the model uh, due to how uh, the particular cost of loans of origination and also cost of issuance of wholesale uh, funding uh, is uh, both uh, formulated and uh, calibrated. Uh, now, I think there is a lot of uh, analytical modeling and computational merit in dealing with heterogeneity. Uh, heterogeneity is a, is a reality. So when you see banks in an industry, you find uh, lots of heterogeneity, different capital positions, different sizes. I think the model is trying to capture that. And you are in good company, because basically there is their very recent econometrica paper by uh, uh, by Erasmo, right, and, and, and Corvée, uh, and, and a few others, but, but you are there, and, and I think this is something uh, to, be, to be seriously taken into account. Uh, at the same time, in the current version, I'm not convinced about how this is calibrated. I don't know how much empirical discipline you are using to make sure that the distribution of funding needs and the distribution of loans that the model generates sort of replicates the distribution in the data, and perhaps more importantly, given the black boxy modeling of the cost genera of generating new loans and the, and the cost of accessing uh, wholesale funding, I would like to see that the model is able to replicate how this distribution moves when the industry is hit by, by a shock by a negative shock. If you were able to do that, I mean, this would be like the next econometric uh, paper in, in some sense, right? So please take my, my comments in terms of that type, that type of, of ambition. Now, in the model, there is dynamic optimization. The banks are uh, interested in maximizing the utility that their owners derive from, from dividends. Uh, there is, as I said already, wholesale funding. Then there is new, new loan origination, and this is subject to constraints. And here, of course, is where the policy analysis enters. The, the constraints banks are subject to come from capital regulation, and the paper is also quite original relative to the literature in considering not just a minimum capital requirement that will be sort of binding all the time, but what in, in the regulatory reality will be called a combined uh, buffer requirement. So, which includes buffers that, as discussed earlier this uh, morning, uh, it can, be, can be used, but maybe banks don't want to use, but can be used in the sense that eating on those buffers, uh, doesn't, if does not violate the, the requirement, is uh, still compatible with the, with the bank operating. So, in the model, you assume that when the uh, capital ratio of the bank is between what in my slides is theta lower bar and theta set, where set is the aggregated state of the economy, what the bank cannot do is pay dividends. And this is very realistic because this is the maximum distributable amount restriction 
associated precisely with it in the, ba the buffers in the Basel three walls. So I think this aspect of the modeling I like very much, but maybe what I don't like, or at least I was a little bit perplexed, is the, the current calibration. Because in the current calibration, as you justify, you have these state contingent values for the upper uh, requirement, so the one that includes the, the regulatory buffers, realistically calibrated, but then I saw that your theta lower bar is zero, so which means that in practice you are allowing banks to violate the minimum uh, all the way down to zero, and the only thing you are doing is uh, restricting their dividends to not be, uh, not be positive in that uh, big area. No? So I, I, when I thought about the, the formulation, I thought the natural choice for theta lower bar would be the regulatory minimum of 8%. Maybe the, the, the code doesn't solve with that, and you are still trying to find the proper, in a sense, a way to, a way to, deal, to deal with this. Uh, now, since I'm running out of time, let me not summarize uh, the sequence of results that you were you were finding, and as I anticipated already, most of uh, my comments there, a, a focus on, on the very last. So I think that the most important uh, uh, learning that we can extract from this type of ambitious project, apart from uh, the, the part dealing with heterogeneity, is uh, the dimension of dynamic optimization, something which is shared with the first paper uh, in the session. And, and to me, uh, there is a sentence in the calibration section, page 12, which is a sort of a killer, because you say that the paper performs very well in terms of matching uh, model moments with data moments, except for a few moments on dividends. You know, and endogenous dividend policy uh, uh, is the most unique aspect of your dynamic optimization and is the one that could interfere with the willingness of banks to use or not use their buffers, which I think is key to the effectiveness of the counter-cyclical capital buffer. So you see there, the right column is, the, is the, uh, the model. The model has twice as big as in reality dividend ratios, plus, but more importantly, uh, three times or, or, or so more volatile dividends. So what happens in this model effectively is that banks don't smooth dividends. And this can be seen, this is the effects of the policy of introducing the CCYB at five percentage points versus not having it at all on bank lending. Okay, there is some smoothing thanks to the buffer, but uh, we see that the, the capital ratios are significantly reduced when the capital buffer is released. So banks are using the buffer, but they are using it to reduce their dividend cuts. So in the baseline economy without the buffers, in your baseline calibration, when the negative shock comes, the average bank fully cancels its dividends. This, unfortunately, banks don't do in reality unless they are forced. So in your model, when you release the buffer, they cut the dividends by half. But this doesn't translate into more, into more lending. Basically, they use their buffers to keep their dividend policies. So I think that if the, if the model could do better on the, on the dynamics of the dividend around crisis, then it would be great for assessing the, the counter-cyclical capital buffer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Taman, do you want to take yes. a few minutes? Thank you very much, uh, Javier, uh, for your very insightful comments. Uh, I take uh, all your points, and uh, we do think that uh, we need to improve upon the dividend part of the model. Um, I, th I think uh, you're, you're right that uh, the calibration uh, a little bit misses in terms of uh, matching the dividend distribution uh, in the stationary state. And I think that's partly because we only hit one year as a sample, but we may need to take a longer average uh, of the, uh, the data, and uh, that way we may be able to have uh, a better outcome. And also, uh, dynamically, uh, 
you write that the dividend movement is quite large in our model, but in reality, the regulators uh, pose uh, restrictions on dividend payout when it's released. So that's currently not existent in our model. So if we impose that, then uh, some of that would go to the uh, uh, new loan issuance, I guess. Um, regarding the uh, regulatory limit of 0%, uh, so we have two regimes, uh, one in which the 8% capital requirement uh, is, is important, but once we assume uh, in the fashion of the prompt corrective action in the US, uh, once they uh, violate that 8% uh, requirement, then the regulator steps in and uh, restricts uh, uh, the uh, discretion of banks to pay out dividends. So it gives them a chance to recover under some uh, restrictions. So that's what they do in our model. And also, I agree that uh, Kobe and the Erasmus paper uh, made a significant uh, advancement uh, in the banking industry model. And uh, relative to that paper, they uh, endogenize uh, many of the demand side. And uh, that, that's something uh, uh, we, we may need to uh, think about uh, in the next revision. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So now we open it to the floor. Rafa and David. This is just a, a question that uh, I didn't understand very well. How does market discipline operate in your model? I mean, how, I mean, a bank. Uh, that changes the risk profile, say, by paying dividends and reducing the capital buffer, then the uh, debt investors outside adjust uh, the uh, cost of their funding. I mean, they, what, what do they see in order to be able to uh, modify the price of the debt? Hi, come on, thanks a lot. This is sort of a similar question that I already posed, even though we have time, let me pose it. So I'm, I would be interested in understanding how much, when you, when you talk about the buffer release of the 1% to the 5%, how much is this an absolute or a relative term type of, type of thing? So if we want to have an impact, it looks like given the current calibration that will change, I guess, in the future, but it looks like you need this 5% to have reasonable effects. But this is because this is 50% of the base level or this is because you need a 5%. So you know you have an 11% base capital that you're releasing you know, from 16.5 to 11. Or is it, if you would have, for example, from 10%, you would only need you know, 3% or something like that. So is there a relation between the levels and the absolute, or is it a relative term? That's basically. OK, so. Uh, Any more questions? Oh, one more. Um. Sure. Okay, so uh, so the market uh, discipline uh, works as an extra uh, premium on wholesale funding. So when the bank decides to increase the leverage, the market investors know that it's going to be more leveraged and more risky. So uh, so it's like the one minus the default probability divided by the risk-free rate. So when the default probability increases, uh, banks are facing a higher discount rate than the risk-free rate. So the amount that they, they can borrow from the market investors is going to be discounted by that amount. Uh, that, that's how the market discipline works in a model. And uh, regarding your question, uh, so we, we assume that uh, the buffer is fully released, so if it's 16.5, then uh, it's fully reduced down to 5%. So I guess it's a matter of the relative decline in the capital buffer that matters. Well, um, I thank here the authors and the discussants for, the, for a great session, and we have uh, half an hour for coffee break, right? Thank you.